Let's continue our tissue discussion and look at nervous tissue. Here's our last. We had epithelial, connective, muscular, and now nervous. Nervous tissue is really all about one very important cell type, neurons. You probably heard of neurons before. Those are the major functional cells of the nervous system that really do most all the work in that system. Now looking at this, you can see that they also produce these things called action potentials. An action potential is an electric signal. And electric signals can be generated very rapidly, just two or three thousandths of a second. They travel very rapidly from the neuron to other structures, and that's a big advantage of them. That's one way that neurons control things in the body. Besides these electric signals, they also use chemical signals. But when you look at neurons, you can see they got three main sections to them. There's a cell body. Sometimes that's called a soma, spelled S-O-M-A. Inside that cell body, you got all the organelles, just like you see with any other cell. It's just maybe a few minor differences in there. The axon is the output part of a neuron. When a neuron conducts an electric signal, it'll travel out and away from the neuron into some other cell through that axon, sort of like little electric wire leading away from it. The dendrites are sort of the opposite. These tiny little branch-like structures are the input part of a neuron. So that's how they receive signals from another cell. And just below this, you can see three different types of neurons based on their structure. There's different ways you can separate neurons out. The structural difference is just one of them. Now, if you look at these three, you see multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar. The multipolar has many dendrites. The bipolar has one, and the unipolar has none. So the number of dendrites is what's varying. And again, with the multi, it has many dendrites. That's where they get the multi from. Now, the bipolar will have one dendrite, one axon. That's one input, one output. With those two poles, that's why they call it bipolar. The unipolar doesn't have any dendrites, just has one axon. So with just that one output part, it's called unipolar. But in addition to neurons, you will also see other cells in the nervous system called neuroglial cells. And sometimes they're just called glial cells. That's going to be any cell in the nervous system that's not a neuron. So there's many different types of supporting neuroglial cells. We'll look at those further along. You'll see these supporting brain, spinal cord, and nerves, nourishing them, providing them with nutrients, protecting them in one way or another, and insulating those action potentials is just a few ways in which they work. Now here you have a couple of histology pictures from the brain. You can see cerebellum on the left and cerebrum on the right. Notice the large neurons in the picture. They're large compared to many cells of the body. And all the little tiny smaller dots are some of those supporting neuroglial cells. You see the same thing over on the right. Here's a few histology pictures from the spinal cord. And you can see the large neurons and all the smaller supporting neuroglial cells. Now let's look a little bit at membranes too. There's three major types of membranes found in the human body. Mucus, serous, and synovial. Now mucus membranes are epithelial line passageways covered with mucus. Mucus is a thick viscous material. It's got water, protein, ions, and trace amounts of other material. But where you'll always find mucous membranes are in the passageways opening to the outside of the body. Of your 11 body systems, four of them, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive, have passageways leading to the outside of your body. Well, that's where you find the mucous membranes. These layers are very much like the epidermis, the outer layer of your skin, but they're not dry and keratinized like that skin is. They're very soft, damp, and moist. And where all that mucus is coming from are goblet cells. So along with the epithelial and goblet cells, you might see a basement membrane, a little lamina propria, which is a little connective tissue, and sometimes some smooth muscle. There are also serous membranes. Now these membranes you're gonna find lining body cavities. You've probably already seen some of these before in a previous chapter. Think like your pericardial, pleural, peritoneal, and so on down the line. These body cavities are around certain organs. <clears throat> the pericardial is only around the heart. The pleural, there's one of those around each lung. And the peritoneal surrounds most organs and structures inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. But you'll see with these serous membranes, as they look at them more, it always has two layers, an inner visceral and an outer parietal. And in between those two membranes, you'll always have serous fluid. It's slippery so that it reduces friction, 
and it also helps to hold the organs in place. Lastly, we have synovial joints. You'll find these in some of the joints of the body. Remember, joints are places where bones come together. Look in some place like your shoulder or your knee. Good examples where you find synovial joints. And in these joints, you'll also find this very slippery fluid called hyaluronic acid. It cuts down on friction. That way, hopefully, those body parts, like that cartilage over the end of bones, doesn't get damaged too quickly. Given enough time, you'll lose it, but the synovial fluid helps to slow that as much as possible. Let's also look for just a second at inflammation. Now, inflammation always happens in a tissue. This is where you'll always see it when you look at the levels of organization. And whenever inflammation is occurring, that tells you that damage has occurred. It's no one particular type of damage, but if anything has damaged the tissue, inflammation occurs. And you always hear about the little suffix itis being added to it at that time. So this is part of the immune response. And look at the five manifestations you see when you get inflammation somewhere. Redness, heat, swelling, pain, and disturbance, meaning loss of function. Now, if you think about why this happens, these chemical mediators of inflammation, some of these you've heard of before, histamine, kinins, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes, they largely act in a couple of different ways. One thing they do, they dilate blood vessels into a damaged area. That brings more blood into it. That's exactly what you want. The tissue's been damaged. You need to bring in more red blood cells. Give those cells oxygen for energy production through aerobic respiration to repair themselves. You need in more white blood cells to remove and destroy things don't belong. Might need platelets to stop blood loss. Going to need more of that plasma because of all the nutrients and many materials that are found in it. Antibodies probably be helpful too. But you figure if they act as vasodilators and they also make blood vessel walls more permeable. That way more blood can move into the tissue. That's why you see these manifestations. Well, if you move more blood into a tissue, of course it's going to look redder. Blood is what moves heat around the body. That's why it heats up. The tissue is literally swelling with blood at that time. And some of these chemical mediators can bind to pain receptors, letting you know that you're damaged. And what they mean by disturbance or loss of function is that when a body part is damaged and hurts, you tend not to use it till it heals up. So all these little chemical mediators right here, just some of the more common ones. You'll see some others in future chapters. Some of these can also cause big problems. Like some of these chemicals can cause contraction of smooth muscle in the bronchi, which are air passageways. It's one thing that happens when somebody has an asthma attack. So we'll see all these chemical mediators a lot more when they talk about immunity. Let's look just a little at tissue repair. So what happens when cells get damaged? Well, there's many ways to categorize cells, but this is one way right here. It's based on their ability to regenerate themselves after they've been damaged. So look at these three categories, label, stable, and permanent. Label cells are those that are always in mitosis. They're always dividing. The epidermis, the outer layer of your skin is a great example. The mucous membranes, those are other epithelial cell layers. Epithelial cells are great examples of label cells. The hemopoietic, where you're making all those blood cells. You make two and a half million red blood cells every second of your life. Lymphatic tissue with lots of white blood cells. Point being, they're always dividing through mitosis. Now, stable cells can go through mitosis, but only after injury. So they're not always doing it like the label cells. So the cells of your liver, pancreas, and others around the body are good examples of those. And then lastly, there's permanent cells. These cannot go through mitosis. If you lose those, that's too bad. You can't make more of them. Neurons and muscle cells like skeletal and cardiac are great examples of that cell type. We can mention just a little about skin repair right here. Let's say somebody's got a cut on their skin in whatever way. You often see two different types of unions. Let's talk about separations in between the edges of the wound, a primary and a secondary. Now with the primary, here the edges are still close together. Maybe if sometimes you had a small cut, maybe like off a piece of paper, you felt the damage, but until you look closely, you didn't really see where it was at. That usually happens when you cut with the aureation of collagen fibers in that dermis. If you cut in the same direction they're oriented, you don't get much gapping. But down at the bottom with the secondary union, where there is a lot of gapping, that's usually where you cut across those collagen fibers. So if you cut with those collagen fibers, which is, remember, what gives you strength in most tissues, 
you don't see a lot of gapping, but you cut across them and you do. So at the primary union, it'll fill with blood, and from that blood, a clot will form. You'll see how that works in a future chapter. And then not long after that, you see a scab. A scab is what's left of a clot after most all the water has been squeezed out of it. That water's called serum. Of course, you'll get the inflammatory response, and another thing that those inflammatory chemicals do is attract white blood cells, attracts them to that area and stimulates phagocytosis, so they'll eat up things that you don't want in the body old dead cells, bacteria, whatever that may be. And you'll have a certain amount of granulation tissue come back into this area. That's what we more commonly call scar tissue. These tissues will have lots of fibroblast, fiber building cells, and they'll make a lot of those strong collagen fibers. Remember that really strengthens up an area and a scar is definitely a very strong area on your skin. So there's a scar mentioned down there at the bottom. Everybody's familiar with those. And then again, there's that secondary union where the edges are not close together. And of course that happens, there's a much bigger chance of infection getting into this area. The clot may not be enough to close that gap easily. You get more of the inflammatory response, a little bit more scarring, and a little bit longer time for all that to heal up. And then we'll mention just a little right here on tissue and aging. Well, cells are gonna divide more slowly as you get older. So tissue repair is definitely gonna take longer. You're going to lose the fibroblasts that build these fibers like collagen. And as you do, you're going to lose strength in those tissues. Look at tendons and ligaments. They're just dense, regular collagen arrangements. They're definitely going to lose their strength, just like many other tissues do. You'll lose elastic fibers in places like the walls of your arteries, and they'll be less elastic. You've probably heard about hardening of the arteries before. You'll see other changes like atherosclerosis. This is due to different things, loss of the elastic fibers and a buildup of plaque inside of the wall too. So you'll have a reduced blood supply so those arteries no longer stretch. That's one thing you don't wanna see with those arteries. You'll see a bit more wrinkling of the skin as you lose the fibers. They won't be as tight and good, nice looking as they were when you were younger. And of course with bones, you'll lose the collagen, which you'll lose the flexibility. Then you'll lose the hard mineral part and they won't be as strong. They'll crack, break and fracture easier. Look at blood cell synthesis. This will cut back inside that hemopoietic tissue. You won't produce as many blood cells as you did before. Injuries are gonna take longer in general. So here's a picture of a neuron. This would be your cell body with all the little organelles, and there's your nucleus. Look at all the dendrites. Dendrite means branch in Latin. They look like a lot of little branches, like tree roots or tree branches coming off that cell body. And again, that's the input part of that cell. There's your axon in red, the output part. And that myelin sheath is adipose tissue around those axons. That makes very good electric insulation. These little nodes of Ranvier are places where those action potentials can jump, and that'll help to speed them up and make them go faster. So here's just a few of the neuroglial supporting cells of the nervous system, like astrocytes, which make a blood-brain barrier and help to protect those neurons from harmful chemicals in the blood. Some of these others are producing the myelin sheet, like you can see with these oligodendrocytes. So those will actually be covered in the nervous system chapter. Here you can see a normal neuron, and look at the axon and myelin sheath here. That myelin covers much of that axon, but with things like multiple sclerosis, that sheath is lost. And if you lose it, think of that myelin sheath as like rubber around a wire that's got an electric current going through it. If you don't have that insulation on the outside, you can no longer keep that current in that wire and electric signals will start to jump and go places they shouldn't. And that means your nervous system can no longer work properly. And that can cause very big problems there. 